Um, the second half of chapter 26 is about the other aspect of the West. The first part, lecture one, we dealt with the cruelty, the atrocities, the, like, I would probably go as far as to say the genocide of an entire group of people, uh, or the attempted just massacring of a culture with the Indian Wars and the reservations and the Dawes Severalty Act. But none of that could have happened without this. And if you look at this slide, what you're seeing is the black represents railroads in operation by 1870, which you can see there are lots of them. Those are those black lines all over the place. And the red represents railroad construction between 1870 and 1890. And you can see that amount only increases. And if you recall, when we were learning about the Civil War, there actually was a law that was passed under a Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, and a Republican-controlled Congress, because the South is gone, that said, we are going to build a railroad. And that law was, of course, and that law, of course, passed during the Civil War, was... I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. Now, I'm actually going to play that whole song for you in just a moment because there is some interesting... Uh, sub subversive messages going on in it. Why is this making so much noise? I think this is dying. I think it's dying. <laughs> and what the law was, was the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862. Remember, that's passed during the Civil War, while the country's kind of going through its own internal conflict. And what it does, and this is the part that you kind of don't think about, it provides grants of land, federal grants of land, for building the transcontinental railroad. So basically they are going to put in place the, the kind of system for building the first transcontinental railroad. And if you look on the map, you will see that transcontinental railroad, and here it is all along. So we'll get to that point in just a moment. Now, here's what happens. The federal government, big idea that you all should know is the federal government is gonna play a key role in the building of the railroad throughout the West. And what that means is, grants of land and subsidies are given to these companies. So grants like big, huge chunks of land or subsidies, so they're getting tax breaks or they're getting land very cheaply the government is kind of handing this over because they want these railroad companies to basically start developing the West. No one's going to go out and do it on their own because there's too much risk and a very little reward. And so what happens is, and this is the thing that a lot of people don't realize, the federal government, big idea, becomes the biggest owner of land in the West. And the reason why that's a big idea is if you study the West, if you know anything about the West, most people think, oh, the West is just a bunch of cowboys or gold miners or cow herders, and, and they go out there, or farmers, and they just go, and they're all individual, rugged West. They're doing it all on their own. But no, the reality is the government plays an important role. Remember the question at the start of the first part of this lecture. So life is changing. Life is changing in the West. In fact, one of the things that happens as a result of this is you have this rapid transformation of the West. Um, if you look at who owns the land, um, that green percentage you see in each state, you will see very clearly that in the western part of the USA, especially Nevada, take a look at Nevada, 84.5% of the land is owned by the federal government. So that could be national parks, that could be uh, uh, national dams, things of that nature. So the land in the West is being developed and the government is playing an active role in it. But it's not just the government. You've got to build this stuff. And these railroads, imagine for a moment, if you take away all the like boring A push, like, okay, I got to learn this law thing. Imagine for a moment, the railroad is not there. If I had Photoshop skills, I would make it disappear. So imagine it's not there. Okay, it's not there. Now you got to build it. And when you're building it, you're building it over different kind of levels of elevation. You're building it through mountains, through forests, through canyons, through all sorts of rugged terrain. If you've ever been driving through this part of the country, 
the western part of the country, it's very barren, desolate, and it's very dry. It gets really hot. It gets really cold. It's difficult. And of course, the most famous thing about the building of the railroad, who does it? Chinese. Chinese. Chinese, I'm hearing. Chinese immigrants. Chinese immigrants, I'm hearing. They got the experience, you know. You know? <laughs> look at it, look at it. Why are you talk like this? <laughs> they got the experience, you know? It is largely. Now, this is the way, you know, history gets kind of watered down, you know, made to be easier. On the West Coast, it is largely, largely Chinese laborers. They even sang a song when they did the railroad building. They didn't sing that, you know, I've been working on the rail. No, they didn't sing that. They sang this. Yeah, I'm Chinese and what? Yeah, you know what this is. Chick, let me tell you this. Days of the poor fried rice and the chicken wings coming in your house while me is over. Y'all gonna learn Chinese. You gonna learn Chinese. What? They rapped while they sang. No, they didn't. That is uh, the Chinese American rapper uh, Jin. I'll, 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 I'll drop his album cover so you can all go buy it or download it from the iTunes store. But it was Chinese immigrant workers. Now, here's the thing where the, the, the story gets kind of uh, simplified. This is the West Coast. They were 90% of the labor force for the Central Pacific Railroad, which was building the railroad from the West to the East. There was a bit of a competition. One, the Central Pacific was going from the west to the east. On the other side, you had the Union Pacific. They were building from east to west. And the idea would be they would eventually meet. Who worked for the Union Pacific? Well, it wasn't majority Chinese. It was a lot of people, Irish, African Americans, immigrants from European countries, uh, just people trying to get the heck out of wherever they were. So the labor force was different depending upon what part of the railroad construction you're talking about. You want to hear more of the, the, the traditional Chinese immigrant railroad song? Oh, here it goes. He's going to rap about the railroad. He's going to say, watch this lyric. We should ride the train for free. We built the railroad. We should ride the train for free. We built the railroads. I ain't to 50 Cent. I ain't to Eminem. I ain't to Jigga Man. I'm, I'm a China Man. Oh, those are some hot lyrics. Now, the thing about the Chinese workers is they had to work for low wages. One of the reasons why immigrants workers, whether they be Chinese or Polish or, or, or any immigrant group, is typically they get exploited. So low wages, they're easier to replace if they try to go on strike. If they try to like demand things, you just kind of say, oh, watch out, you're going to you know, get in trouble. So, and they had a, a, a reputation for working very hard, very efficiently, and it was the Chinese immigrant workers who do that job, especially in the Sierra Nevadas, for example. Sierra Nevadas, the mountain ranges, and it's some dangerous stuff. You're putting dynamites and mountains and then blowing it up, and then sometimes it blows up before you get away, and a lot of people are injured or killed in building the railroad. So this is part of this story. Now, for those of you that became oh, a fan, I know him. you know him. Is he cousin or something? Or? Oh, is he in that? Oh. Oh. Oh, did he? Okay, look, he's a legend. He's a local legend. Uh, so there he is. Everybody say hey! Very famously, this, this, this moment uh, is a kind of a significant moment because it is the end of the kind of be, the end of the project building the first transcontinental ra railroad. Uh, very famously, they uh, meet at Promontory Point in Utah, and basically, this is the meeting. You'll notice something here. Uh, the Chinese workers um, are not represented in this photo, so their sacrifices, you know, in history, typically we know about the kind of famous railroad companies. Uh, Vanderbilt was one of the railroad uh, men. Stanford, the guy who was uh, uh, the, the founder or the inspiration for the university, uh, Stanford was a railroad guy. He made a lot of money. 
So those guys, they become famous, but the workers are the ones who really did it. Now here's the thing. About 170 million acres of land is given uh, to these companies to build these railroad um, projects. And it took a lot of difficult work to make this type of project happen. Now, interestingly enough, uh, these Chinese workers, once the railroad projects are kind of done, many of these Chinese uh, immigrants end up staying and setting up communities uh, in places like uh, San Francisco. If you ever go to San Francisco, the Chinatown there is, is quite large. And, and the, the irony or the, the, the craziness of it is when you think of Western history, you oftentimes think of white settlers moving west, farmers, this type of thing. But the Chinese have been in America uh, for a very long time. Uh, the gold rush brought a lot of Chinese immigrants to California. So keep in mind the diversity of the West. Key point, because they may ask you on the AP exam, you know, what was the myth of the West versus the reality of the West? And the reality of the West is you have these Chinese, uh, African-American, Irish immigrant workers doing this. You have the federal government giving tons of land to these railroad companies to build railroad. And you'll notice something here. Uh, if you notice something here, the country's divided. How is it divided? Time zones. And that is a result of this time period. The railroad companies are the first ones to introduce these kind of time zones. And officially, Congress will adopt it later on. Because if you think about it, if you're in the railroad industry, you're selling the promise of getting people or product from one point to another by a certain time. And if you don't have consistency in the time or the time zones, you're going to have a difficult time fulfilling that promise. So you have this thing. Now, Oh, children. How many of you have heard of a Eurail pass? Eurail. 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 You have? This is not a push. Wait, I, I need a. I oh know. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Welcome to Mr. Joseph's random piece of life advice that you didn't ask for, edition number 237. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm just going to take this moment because I was talking about trains, and probably most of you have never really taken trains anywhere. Maybe you have, maybe you went on a choo-choo train, maybe you went to Travel Town as a little child. Maybe you were at the LA Zoo and you rode around the zoo. But I want to tell you something because... That's what old people do. And here's what I'm going to tell you. When you all leave this wonderful place called Downtown High School. <laughs> it's on YouTube. You don't want them to find this, right? Downtown High School in the friendly city of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> That's where we are. Google us. Uh, you <laughs> will go off to college, and it is my hope you will explore the world. And one of the amazing things that you have at your disposal is the ability to get one of these passes, Eurorail passes. And what it is, is in Europe, their train systems, and we're not talking like trains like when you think of like the Old West and moving cows or something. We're talking like bullet type trains like the one you see right here. And these trains are the most efficient, amazing thing, and you... I think it's up to the age of 25, are eligible to get highly discounted uh, passes for it. And what those passes allow you to do is you can pretty much go, as you see on this map, anywhere in Europe. You can go from England to Paris to Portugal to Rome to Poland using trains. And these trains are comfortable, they are efficient, and when you are young, they are more affordable. Now, I'm not going to say they're cheap because Europe is not a cheap place, but guess what? When you're in college, you could probably study abroad, and you can get some of your little grants or loans to pay for your semester abroad. Say you're studying in Madrid, and over the weekend, you say, I'm going to Paris. You can literally go to Paris 
in a few hours. Now, how would I do it? Because I was just a little American. I'll get lost. I'll get. I've seen taking one and taking two, <laughs> and there will be a handsome man who will wait for me and abduct me. And the only way I will survive is my father, who is an ex-trained something. We don't know, but he kicks ass. He will come and save me, and then I will be scarred for life. Um, it's not going to happen. In fact, I have uh, friends, both males and females. Some of the females are tougher than my male friends, and females that are like four foot one, like midgets. They go and they travel. Not midgets. They don't have the big stumpy fingers, but they. You go, and, and it's so amazing because you can go to the train station and literally just look at the board and say, "Oh, this place is going. They're going to Amsterdam. They're going to Munich. They're going to Frankfurt." And you go to the track and you get on the train and you have your backpack on you. And that's how you travel. Yeah, that's me. You just put all your junk in a bag and you roam. Now, oh, you could roam to Rome. Ha, 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 right? Now, the wild thing about it is, for those of you that are thinking about, like, okay, this doesn't seem real. Because when you're 15, 16, 17, sitting in high school... Doesn't feel like you will ever go anywhere besides, you know, like maybe you'll go to the, you know, the Grove one evening and that'll be a wild day. <laughs> uh, but but life will present options and take them because here's one possibility here. One possibility, thank you, sir. One possibility is that that you will be able to go and you won't find someone to go with you. And then what will you do? I'm not going to go because. If I go, I'll be all by myself, and I'm going to be lonely, and I'm going to write in my journal or my diary, and I'm going to cry. Well, um, so there's me and my buddy. You can take buses, too, because it doesn't have to be trained, but I figured this is a good moment to talk to you about trains, because I'm telling you about trains, so I'll tell you about trains that actually are real uh, that you can use. So me and my buddy, we, we traveled around, but he was with me some of the trip in Europe, and then other times I was solo. But guess what? You stay in hostels. And in hostels, I'll tell you about this in another chapter because I don't want to spend too much time, but in hostels, you actually meet people because that's what happens in hostels. You stay in a room like a dorm with a bunch of other people. It could be co-ed, it could be single sex, depends on what you're comfortable with. And basically, you meet people and you, hey, what are you doing today? I'm going here. Oh, cool, let me go with you. Now, I'm going to give you another tip because here's the thing. Everyone wants to go to Europe, right, because you've read about it, you've heard about it. Like, it seems easy, right? That's where the Mona Lisa is, so it must be safe, right? <laughs> so you can take buses, but you could do this. For those of you that have family in Latin America, now you may not be able to do it when you're, you know, still under 18. Your parents may say, no, you're not going, mija. But <laughs> when you're older, you could take a bus anywhere. Once you get into the southern part of Mexico, you could take buses within Mexico, but you could go anywhere in Central America, including beautiful Costa Rica, Panama, and these buses are really nice. These routes are in place, and they're safe. And, 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 and you know, something could happen, but something can happen walking up the street, going home today uh, to go do your eight push homework. And, 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 and in Mexico or Central America, it's super cheap compared to Europe. Or, screw that, like, why don't you go, oh, I didn't put the other one. The other ex example is Asia. You could do this all through Asia. I rode through Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. Guess how much I speak of any of those languages? Zero. <laughs> okay, I have friends that are small, petite girls, big, huge girls, big, huge guys, and they've all done this, and you meet people who have crazy adventures. So part of the, the kind of remarkable thing about this period in history is that this change is happening, right? The country is being more connected, but if you really think about it, the world is connected. And you guys, you know, like, do things. Don't just go to college, graduate, get married, have two kids, get a dog, get a fish tank, get a cat, then have grandkids, and then die. Oh, no. <laughs> That's the sad life. Yes? How did you communicate when you don't know something? How do you communicate? Yeah. You, you, you get a little, like, phrase book and say, uh, you know, Ayang haseyo, come to me now. Sit down, sit down, you know, uh, you know. Guten Tag, Guten Morgen, you know, you just kind of come up with a few words, and guess what? Beer, beer, donde esta the baño, poor favor. You learn a few words, and then at the end of the day, uh, the people that are in the hostels or selling train tickets or bus tickets, they speak English because that's the language of business, and that's the language of travel, so you find a way. So... You know, don't let language scare you. Don't let getting around scare you. Don't let safety scare you. Be smart, but don't 
you know. So, anyways, so one day if you ever go anywhere, uh, send me a postcard. Now, here's the thing. Ho! For Kansas. The railroad companies, <laughs> the railroad companies are, are heavily advertising this idea of the West. And one of the things you see in, in these advertisements is this kind of portrayal of the West as, as this utopia, as a place where, where you could go, anybody could go, they could start over, and they could have this tremendous opportunity. It almost was portrayed, excuse me, as like a Garden of Eden. So these are two railroad ads kind of encouraging people to go West. One, you know, kind of more of a text-based thing, but talking about the land. Take a look under the, the date, in pursuit of homes in the southwestern lands of America, rates cheaper than ever was known before. And over here you have this kind of angelic figure with these little dwarf baby kids with wings, and, you know, it, it, it has this sense of hope and opportunity. And what happens is a lot of people move west, but things are changing. You know, you have this vision of small little farmers, going west, growing stuff. But the reality is um, people are specializing in cash crops. You've heard that term before when I talked about tobacco in Virginia or rice in South Carolina or cotton in most of the South. But you're talking about things like wheat. Wheat is a big cash crop in the West. We're talking about things uh, that are not necessarily crops but, but part of agriculture. We're talking about cows, cattle. California is going to be an important part of, of this story. So all this stuff's happening, but you are missing something. We're missing something, boys and girls. I know you're like, what is it? What is it? Well, you can build a train, but you need a way for people to access land. And that's where this comes in play. How are you going to get people to want to be farmers? And if you don't remember this reality, it's like one of the first early reality shows of these two morons, <laughs> where they filmed them pretending to be farmers. Uh, you know their names? Paris Hilton, there you go. And uh, I don't know the other one. Uh, she's some rich chick, right? Nicole Richie, there you go. There it is. So what you need is a way for people to go and get land. Oh, guess what? We took care of that during the Civil War. There was another law passed. What was it? Homestead Act. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the animal play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy. The whole point of the Homestead Act, passed in 1862, was to encourage people to settle the West. Now, obviously, during the Civil War, the ability to actually kind of get this thing going on a big scale is, is restricted. But here's what happens. This is extremely important. You want people to go West. You want people to go west and develop their crops. You don't want them to actually just pretend by tapping a button to be growing things. If you play this game, you need serious help. <laughs> but you need people to go west. And if you take a look at this map, you see the areas by 1870s that are settled, settled the orange, 1880s, the red, 1890. So here's how you're going to do it. The Homestead Act is passed, and basically it says you are going to go west. But why do you want people to go west? We are farmers. Bum, da, da, bum, 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 bum. We are farmers. Bum, da, da, bum, 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 bum. You want that old thing we've been talking about for a while. You want people to be economically independent. Remember, Jefferson was all about like the farmers, land. You know that was an ideal from our early period. But more importantly, you want markets. You want the ability to to create markets. We are a capitalist society. You want people to be growing things and selling things. And you want people to be buying things. And so these people would go west. The railroads would profit because there would be, you know, commerce taking place. And then you would have this market available. Now, how did it work? 
Like, it, you know, I said it encouraged land settlement. Well, and then there's the farmer's market every Tuesday. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but I hope you like corn. We love corn. Everyone loves corn. And what that basically did is you get 160 acres of land. And what you could do is you have to live on the land for five years. So you're going to get 160 acres of land. You live on the land for five years. And at the end of your five years, you could buy it for a very affordable processing short little fee. Maybe like $30. Now, that's the kind of how it worked, but this is the most important point of the Homestead Act. We've already had land policy before. Let's see who's going to get an A on the mock exam next week. Can anybody tell me one of the first examples of a government selling land to people for very cheap prices? The what? What? Northwest Ordinances. That was under the Articles of Confederation. Now, if you recall, though, why is the government of the United States, the Articles of Confederation, why was it selling land to people? What was the purpose? Think about how the country was during the American Revolution and after the Revolution. Um, not, not, that's not a main thing. Let me just ask you a real basic question. Was the country rich? Or struggling for money. Uh, and by selling land, what would you raise? Money. Oh, smart children. <laughs> Repeat after me. You is smart. <laughs> you is special. <laughs> and you is kind. <laughs> Did I butcher it? Yes. Oh, darn it. I'll watch the movie the weekend, this weekend. <laughs> so here's the thing that's unique about the Homestead Act. This is not about raising revenue. Yeah, there's a small fee. Here's what it's about. We are farmers. Bum, da, da, bum, 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 bum. We are farmers. Bum, da, da, bum, 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 bum. It sets a precedent. And what I mean by that is its whole goal is to encourage settlement. The government of the United States is not seeking necessarily to raise money to pay off a debt or anything like this. The whole purpose of it is to encourage people moving west. And this is, this is not something that had been done before. So this movement, this opportunity starts presenting itself. And as you can see on this map, people are moving west. Now you may notice there are gaps in areas where there is settlement, and that's because some of those gaps have things like Grand Canyons or giant mountains or deserts. Not all places people want to live, but people are moving into the west. Approximately a million settlers go west under the Homestead Act. There's a problem, though. And the first problem, amongst many problems, is it sounds wonderful. Too good to be true. And to a certain extent, it was. Notice what I said. You get 160 acres of land. If you don't know, that's a lot of land. But it's not enough land to actually do anything really substantial agricultural-wise on the Great Plains. So they actually passed two additions to the Homestead Act. One is the Timber Culture Act. You don't need to remember dates. But just in case they try to throw that at you, the Timber Culture Act and the Desert Land Act. And basically what those things do, and it's real easy to remember, if you plant trees on your land, you can get more land. And the Desert Land Act is if you irrigate your land, you can get more than the 160 acres of land. Because the problem was 160 acres of land wasn't enough to actually turn profit or to survive. So you could get more land by planting trees, or by irrigating the land. Now, people go. What you need to realize, I told you like about a million went. We don't know for sure. About a million went. Keep in mind, when you go west, this is not like driving to the movies. You pack your stuff in a wagon, because most of the railroads are not, you know, 
accessible at this point. They're not even built until 1869. You move west, you're going into uncharted territory in many cases. When you get there, you have to build your own home. There is not like, you know, a real estate agent waiting for you saying, yes, let me show you. This one has a lovely den and atrium that brings in lots of natural sun. No, you got to build your own home. Um, I don't know if you've ever been out into this part of the country, but it is the Great Plains. You know what they don't have a lot of? Trees. Trees. So that means you don't have access to wood. So you got to build your home without wood. And what do you build your home out of? Sod. What is sod? Dirt, grass, mud, buffalo poop. <laughs> In fact, this woman is collecting what was affectionately called buffalo chips <laughs> for burning. And the burning of buffalo chips was intended to keep you warm. It's your firewood because you don't have trees and you don't have central air or, or central heat. I love a little girl just sitting there. It looks like she's producing more buffalo chips for her mom. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but that's what I imagine. Um, so you built your sod house. Somewhere out on the Great Plains, there you are with your family. I mean, it's some country living. I love this one. You got the, the cow on the roof. You know? So you're building your, your sod house. Life is uh, difficult because not only do you have to build your own home, you have to plow your field, you have to plant your first crop, and you got to work, and it's about 68 hours of work a week to get this thing going. Most likely, you are not exactly surrounded by neighbors because you are out there in the, the uh, West, um, so you're doing this. So this idea of a Garden of Eden was probably not a reality for most people. You know times are rough when your roof has grass growing on it. This family is a mess. Just, just, just look at the dude. Then look at the woman. Then look at the kid. I'm going to move on because they creep me out. Here's another home. Beautiful, right? Lovely. Look at her. She was all Yeah, yeah. We're white out in the dirt. Smart one. <laughs> uh, the Homestead Act was available. Uh, there were there are a number of African American people who took advantage of it. Obviously, they faced uh, discrimination and prejudice very often. Uh, it's one of my the, the saddest images ever in American history. Uh, I don't know if any of you noticed the, the, the tragedy that's occurring here. The dog gets to sit. Yeah, the dog, the white dog. <laughs> the white dog sits while the black man stands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reconstruction failed, I bet. Uh, and in all seriousness, like the, 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 the opportunities of the West were, were immense, but the reality was difficult. This family just is... is, is because <laughs> you gotta, you gotta keep in mind, there's no uh, super Walmart or Target available to buy your clothes or whatnot. So you got all the clothes, all the kids wearing the same pattern shirt. Okay, you probably gotta get sick of that, right? Uh, and you're moving out west, and here's just one of many problems. So you're moving out west. You gotta plant your ha your crop. You gotta, you know, grow your first crop. You gotta build your home. It's very lonely. It's very dirty. The weather is unpredictable. There's a lot of things going on. And if you look at this map, one of the things you'll notice is the rainfall totals are very, very low in the area of the Great Plains. In fact, they are this brownish color, which means they get under 10 inches of rainfall a year. And so drought was a major problem. Now keep in mind, if it don't rain, your crops don't grow. So life was hard. In fact, there's a whole bunch of problems. Drought, um, loneliness, uh, theft possibly. There's a whole bunch of problems that you probably would even think about that if you are one of these homesteaders, it sounds like this, the most amazing thing on earth, right? This land, 160 acres, like 30 bucks after five years you got problem after problem. Another one, 
grasshoppers. Grasshoppers that could eat your crops in hours. Everything you've grown will just get wiped out. Mother Nature is a problem. It's too cold, your crops die. It's too hot, your crops die. So a lot of homesteaders left. So I said about a million people went, but a lot of people went, for example, to places like Kansas, set up farms, failed and went back. But it was an opportunity, but it was presented with challenges. Remember what I asked you at the beginning of the lecture. What were the opportunities presented by the West? Well, there were some challenges too. But people did go. In fact, by 1862, you know, this is kind of roughly the settlement line of the country, you know, where the, the population was kind of, you know, settled up until this point. But as people are moving west, you got new states forming. You do not need to memorize the states that are formed, but I just want to show you in 1889, 1890, in just a year's time, you get six new states formed. If you look over there on the right, you will see states admitted. And you'll notice there were, there were kind of big chunks of years that went by before states were kind of added into the Union. But as this movement west starts happening, more and more and more people are going west. Random fact, just in case they ask you, Utah finally becomes a state in 1896. And if you recall, Utah has been uh, populated with people for a while. The problem was the religion of Mormonism was not exactly uh, uh, supported uh, by a lot of people. And one of the reasons why in 1896 they're able to finally become a state is because polygamy is banned by the Mormon church officially. So that kind of removes that big controversial thing. And then in 1896, it is uh, adopted into the Union. 